Well, the we had Libya, we had many, countries many Countries in this neck of the woods were much more involved in the Syrian civil war than my country was. Well, you're also so do you want to take some responsibility for that? It would be easy to snigger about this until you've had friends shot in a newspaper office. In this video, we're going to watch Douglas Murray go to Doha in Qatar to have a discussion that turns into a very heated debate about the global refugee crisis. And the way that the host ambushes him here and the way that Douglas Murray handles himself is something to see. So be sure to stick around until the end, guys, because after Douglas Murray's opening remarks, this gets wild. So with that, I'll introduce the other speaker that we're going to focus on on this panel, which is Mark Lamont Hill. Mark Lamont Hill is an academic, an author, and an activist from the United States. Problematic. To talk about refugees as a crisis is to ask the wrong question at the wrong time. Rather than beginning with the entirely reasonable question of what do we do with these people who have arrived here, we must first ask an equally reasonable but far more urgent question. What are the social, cultural, economic, and intellectual conditions that led these people to our doors? Before we deliberate about what to do with Mexicans at the southern U.S. border, many of whom assume a de facto refugee status, we must instead consider the trade agreements and exploitative labor practices that actively undermine the possibility of prosperity within Mexico. Prior to wrestling with the question of Syrian refugees, we have to answer the years of American foreign policy, and we have to consider the years of American foreign policy that have helped to destabilize the region. By framing the issue differently, we not only become more intellectually honest, but we're also better equipped to arrive at sustainable solutions. To solve the refugee issue, we must first commit to reimagining citizenship in more interesting, dynamic, and practical ways. We must also consider the crisis of memory. Far too often, the people clamoring to close the borders forget that they themselves were beneficiaries of openness, either as former refugees or otherwise desperate immigrants looking for new possibilities in a new land. Rather than closing the door behind us once we've safely passed through the door, we must do the difficult but necessary work of creating sites of safety for those who come after us. We must remember who we are. We must also remember the horrors that have occurred when we have failed to properly tend to refugees. Consider, for example, in the, in the 1930s, when the US and Europe refused to provide refugee status to Jewish brothers and sisters, desperately fleeing Nazi Germany. Our moral failure contributed to one of the greatest atrocities in human history. We cannot repeat such acts of moral indifference and outright evil by failing to remember our mistakes. Speaking of mistakes, we must take seriously the question and the crisis of supremacy. Simply put, we live in a world where we believe that some lives are inherently worth more than others. This belief, undergirded by white supremacy, Orientalism, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism, allows us to view some lives as worthy of protection and others as disposable. It allows us to see some cultures as compatible with our society and others as an inherent threat to our way of life. This doesn't mean that there aren't real and tangible political and cultural differences that we must consider. We must do that. But even those differences can't be properly understood or reckoned with until we address our core biases. And speaking of biases, we must tackle the crisis of representation, particularly in the media. The media, both traditional and new forms, offers most citizens their window into the human experience. The media shapes how we identify and assess social problems. The media gives us a sense of what our available solutions are. The media tells us whose lives matter and whose don't. As long as we are beholden to a narrow range of corporate media sources, themselves committed to a narrow range of ideas and shot through with the very biases that I just referred to, we will struggle to think outside the constraints of the current moment. So, what do we do? The million dollar question that all academics hate to answer. We must resist. We must address each of these crises with the belief that organized people can and do defeat organized power. That means we vote, we march, we think, we boycott, we teach, we write, we sing, we debate, all in ways that undermine the current power structure and create the possibility for freedom and safety for refugees around the world. Thank you so very kindly. So he actually made some decent points there about Western culpability in the migrant crisis because US foreign policy 
has been largely responsible for much of this conflict, especially in the form of destabilizing other governments and launching wars. And this is such a complicated and complex issue. And there's so many different moving parts and different perspectives and different historical events of importance. So it's not something that I have real convictions about in terms of my beliefs, because I'm not really sufficiently knowledgeable enough, but I will give points and opinions throughout this video. And the main reason for that is just to open it up to a discussion, because I'm actually really looking forward to hearing what you guys say about it, because as always, I'll probably learn a lot from my comments section. So especially the people who are watching who live in Europe, and if there's anybody that's actually been through the immigration system themselves, or people who are living in the Middle East, then I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. So introducing the second speaker. Douglas Murray is the author of multiple best-selling books, such as The Strange Death of Europe, which directly addresses this issue. Douglas has not only been studying this for many years, but he's had his boots on the ground and he's been at the coalface and experienced exactly what's going on so he's a very wise and knowledgeable individual in this field well thank you very much it's a great pleasure to be with you here in doha uh, i've been traveling across several continents in recent years not just to the countries that people are fleeing from around the world but also to the places they're fleeing to to the refugee camps migrant camps that people end up in and I've been struck by so many thoughts during this time, but one of them is that there are so many utopian dreams that occur. People dream that you could live in a borderless world on one hand. Other people pretend you could just stop anyone coming. These are impossible dreams, but somewhere in the middle of them is something we need to aim for. And one of the ways I've started to realize that we need to think about this is in the following terms, not about right or wrong or you know, good and bad, uh, I'm a good person, you're a Nazi, it's too easy. What we need to think about with this is that we're in a situation with migration talking about competing virtues. There are two virtues in this whole debate that are in serious competition, not just between people, but within all of us. The first virtue, I would say, is the virtue of mercy, the desire to be merciful to our fellow human beings who are suffering. And we all feel that. Everybody should feel that. But there is also another virtue here, the virtue of justice. And that's not just justice for people fleeing countries, but justice for people in the countries that they are fleeing to. And we can't ignore those two parts. We need to recognize that's what's going on here. This is why it's so difficult, and the debate goes down the middle of all of us. So look, there are so many questions we need to think about if we're going to address this. And I'm so glad, by the way, this isn't a debate, because this is a very not debatable issue why we need to think about this. Let me give you just six examples of things we need to think about much more deeply than we have. The first is this. I would suggest it is very obvious that the developing world cannot move to the developed world. So what do we do? Who can come? That's one quest part of that question. And the second part, which is much harder, who can't? We are very, very bad at having even a bit of that debate, but we need to. Secondly, what are the differences between people fleeing for their lives from a war zone and people fleeing serious, severe economic deprivation in, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa? Now, there are differences, but if you recognize that, then you've got to work out where along the way you would put your line for legitimate asylum claims. A third of people in sub-Saharan Africa polled last year by Gallup said they wanted to move and leave sub-Saharan Africa. So you've got to work out along this way if you're going to have a sustainable asylum policy, who qualifies for it? And I would suggest we're not very good at having that discussion either. A third point. We know that some cultures find it easier to mix into other cultures than others, but we don't know exactly how. And we don't know what the proportions of people are in another culture that work well, integrate well, adapt well, and what the proportions are that start to make that integration, that adaptation far harder. We have thought very little about this, and what thinking there has been has been pretty bad. Let me give you another example of something we need to think about. How do we deal with a question this serious in the age of social media? An age when a single photograph of a single person can go all around the world, and everybody sees it, and everybody says something must be done. And their politicians think, I've got to do something. And then they do something, and the public say, no, that wasn't the something we were thinking of. We've thought of something else, but we don't know what. How do we live in that world? How do politicians act in that world? How do we have any form of political leadership in that world? How do we work out what the right thing to do is in that world? Not just in the short term, but in the long term too. I'll give you a fifth question. How do we ensure that we're able to have a serious and deep debate about these issues and that we're able to allow people to express legitimate concerns and have that debate without those legitimate concerns being dismissed 
as xenophobic, nativist, and so on. How do we work out where that might be the case? And how do we work out where it's not, where there are legitimate fears? Sixth question, how do we overcome fatalism? Fatalism you hear everywhere these days, sometimes in the spirit of optimism. This is the world as it is now. People move. This is globalization. Get used to it. Suck it up. Don't complain. How do we get used to that? How do we deal with that? Now, I've got, rather unsurprisingly, fewer answers than I've got questions. But let me give you just three answers I would suggest that we could hold on to as the beginning of a set of answers to this. The first is hold a very clear line between people fleeing for their lives from war zones and people fleeing economic deprivation. Find and hold to a very clear line on it. If you do not, I predict with absolute certainty that you will continue to erode public sympathy with people who need the sympathy the most because these things will be rubbed together and elided. So, how, so I would suggest, first of all, find that and hold on to it pretty close. Second thing I would suggest, find a broad level of agreement, and there is a lot of this internationally now, that the best way to cope with the most serious situations is to keep people roughly in the area of the country for which they fled. It's much easier to look after them there. It's much easier to get international aid there. My own country, Great Britain, is, I think, the second largest donor of international aid within the regions of Syria. That should, I think, be one of the models for this, that we, we make sure that people... We don't have this idea that some people have that you disperse X percentage there and X percentage there and put these people there. Thirdly, I would say, make sure you increase economic productivity in refugee camps. Make sure people have a hope and a purpose and a work life when they're outside of their country. Look, I'm concluding with this because otherwise the music will get so loud you won't hear me. There are no simple answers to this because there are no simple questions in this. This whole business does not give itself to sound bites, but it does need a much deeper debate than most of us have been willing to have so far. Thank you. Can you imagine the titanium balls that Douglas Murray must possess to get up on stage in Qatar, in the Middle East, where most people are going to be completely against you in regards to this topic and give the hard truths and ask the difficult questions about such a hairy topic that has so much emotional involvement for so many people. And some of the points that he made there, such as saying it's too easy to just call someone a Nazi because they disagree with you, are so true. And in many cases, that's basically the state of the discussion. And then the next thing he said, which was, in my opinion, very wise and profound, it's about balancing mercy and justice. Much of the woke let's have open borders mob will tell you that you're a Nazi and you're evil if you disagree with them. Whereas much of the more extreme ends of nationalism will tell you, nope, we can't let anybody in and we have to completely preserve everything the way that it is. And in my assessment, both of those sides actually give rise to one another. And as he said, somewhere in between, which is a very fair and balanced assessment by Douglas Murray, is probably where the best solution lies. And he posed six questions there, and they're all very valid questions and quite uncomfortable questions. However, questions that need to be asked. And it's a lot harder to do that than to just get up there and say, let's all be nice. And as is the job of a journalist, he has fewer answers than he does questions and that's understandable. Some of the suggestions that he did pose act as really good food for thought. My favorite of which being encouraging deep and sincere discussion and debate around the topic and also providing better economic conditions for productivity and for people to be able to have a purpose when they're stuck in these refugee camp hell holes. And when people have had the absolute shit bombed out of them and they've been displaced from their countries and they've got no choice about it, then it would be very easy to lose hope. And I think that hope and purpose are things that are absolutely fundamental to life. So that doesn't sound too terrible by Douglas Murray, does it? Well, here comes the host with her astoundingly obvious biases. Stick around, guys, because this one is about to get very interesting. But if you like this content and if you want to show some love to the page, then chuck a thumbs up, leave me a comment, subscribe to the channel, and turn on all notification bells so that YouTube doesn't hide this content from you. All right. <laughs> Douglas Murray, thank you very much. A few provocative thoughts, no doubt, that you mentioned there. A few jumped at me, such as when you said, the developing world cannot move to the developed world. You seem to conveniently forget that the developed world moved to the developing world without asking permission. No, I don't. That, I don't. It, it seems to me as well that this is a particularly Western-centric view to, viewpoint and a misleading one at that, because you know as well as I do, and the figures show it, 
85% of the world's refugees, in fact, settle in neighboring countries mm -hmm. in the Middle East, sure. in Africa, and Asia. They do not rush over to Europe. Sure. Uh, I, you'd make a big mistake if you think I hadn't heard of colonialism. Mm. Oh. Um, you don't and seem to I address also, it in And I'd way. also suggest, by the way, that it's, 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 it, I don't know how long we're going to go on about colonialism for. I'm happy to do it as long as you like. But, but let don't me we just have to be factful, though? Well, don't we have to be but also don't careful think it, about But don't think, if I may history. say so, that colonialism was just a Western thing. What was one of the largest and most significant empires in history but the Ottoman Empire? Do we say that Turkey has to do something like the West to deal with That's this? That's not the issue. You, well, are, you brought up colonialism. You, you are talking about the Western view that they should stay where they belong. I'm saying that it's, it seems to me to be much wiser that if you have a very large humanitarian crisis in, for instance, Syria, you try to make sure that people remain in the area. This isn't say all of them, but, they do. but it is more likely. I, I absolutely agree they, they do. do. I've I mean, seen look, it look firsthand. At what I'm suggesting. Five million refugees. Look at Lebanon and Jordan per capita. What the I'm countries suggesting that have the most. to you is, in fact, in Lebanon, you've got one in every four person living in that country is absolutely. a Syrian refugee. Absolutely. So to suggest what they're not doing very much is just being misleading, believe being me, dishonest. Believe me, I'm not being misleading. And I said from the outset that I agree with the point that most refugees remain in the area. And I said that I think that that's a good idea. I'm suggesting to you that I think it's better that people, for instance, fleeing Syria, end up in the countries around Syria in order to be able to return to their country than putting them in but Norway. But they won't return. You are suggesting that they don't want to return. Who in their right mind, if they, they had the option... I'm not suggesting they don't want to return. When did I say that? hear from a refugee, if they had the option to return, of course they'd want to return. I didn't home. say they wouldn't. They leave everything behind. But you seem to also be oblivious to another important fact that I just want to throw at you before we go to a video clip that I want to show you. It's what about the moral responsibility, though, of Western countries that have contributed to the destabilization of the region, the meddling, the military interventions, not to mm -hmm. mention the arms sales that continue as we speak. Mm -hmm. What about that? Do you that want me to answer that? Okay. Okay, I'll answer that one frankly. Uh, nobody denies, for instance, the disaster of Iraq, but who are the people who intervened most in it Syria? Isn't just hang on, hang on. Let me answer it. Who intervened most in Syria? It wasn't America, it wasn't Britain. It's Iran, Russia. It's, among others, countries, including the one we're in and others you're, you're around deflecting. the Gulf before, here. Before we got to Let's Syria, we had it, Iraq, we had Libya, we had many Countries many in this neck of the woods were much more involved in the Syrian civil war than my country was. Well, you're also so do you want to take some responsibility for that? Do you think, want to take think, more refugees here can, in Qatar? Do you want to take around. more in the Gulf? No one right. is immune to any sort of criticism. But, so, well, but we're talking about glad to hear the Western it. countries, the British countries, uh, the British... What did Britain do in Syria? We're talking about these governments that you seem to suggest should be immune no, or when should did I be suggest that? absolved of any responsibility. When did I suggest that? I want to get to the other point that you make, and it's an important one, Douglas Murray. You suggest that we need to actually balance between two very important mm. virtues, two important concepts mm. of mercy toward the refugee and justice toward your sure. own citizens. Let's take a quick look at this instance involving refugees. Do you see anyone for us? We are the Syrians. Sir, uh, I give you the number of mouth uh, authority because you are near mouth. Hello? Yes. About 100 children and 100 women and uh, and one and uh, maybe 100 men. Please hurry. Water is uh, coming into it. The boat is going down. We are dying. 300 yes, children. You, are, you are have dying. called Malta. You have called Malta. Don't throw us. You can run away. Call Malta, call Malta. I, I have no enough account on the mobile if you cut, please. You yes. have my number now. You call me you, please. A very chilling video, though I don't suggest that you um respond on behalf of the Coast Guard, the Italian Coast Guard. But again, it's that same issue of shifting the, the problem to others. And just for a little bit of context, in fact, this boat, which capsized five hours after this call, killing quite a few people on board, we heard that there were about 100 women, 100 children on board, uh, that was twice as close to an Italian island as it was to Malta. But again, this idea that, you know, we have to safeguard our values, where does mercy fit in that? Not just mercy, but the obligation, well, the legal obligations of states to I'd suggest, refugees. I'd suggest that we all make sure we don't shift responsibility. Uh, there is a responsibility to everyone. That would include the state we're standing in now, wouldn't it? It would include all the states in this region. It would include the brother states. It would include the Ummah. It would include everybody. It wouldn't just be the Italians. Now, the Italians, by the way, and I could, let me just finish but, but this that's point. That's a valid, the valid Italians, issue. Let me respond to it. Let me, because let me you finish the, the point. States of the, because the, region, the Italians, it's a valid issue. But the unlike the European let countries, allow me to point. just make this point. And like the point. European countries, I'll respond to two they, points they are not parties to the 1951 Refugee Convention. So Conveniently. The obligations are, well, it's just a fact. Conveniently, isn't but it? But I'll let you carry on. It's but this means that countries that are signatories 
to the refugee conventions, get more blame and more assumption that they are going to have to hold more of the burden than countries that didn't. And I'm choice. suggesting to you that nobody should be, should be able to absolve themselves from blame. But if you go to Italy now, and I don't know when you were last there, but it is not the case that this is going well in Italy, either for the migrants who are arriving or for the Italian population. But isn't it because you don't the resources see these are not being poured out. into this? Let's face it, the policies are not there, the resources aren't there. I, it I isn't see about these the overwhelming people numbers. when they arrive, I follow their stories, they, they, this is not, it is not the case just that they don't you know, the, 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 local, the local populations in Italy have I've been to Lampedusa, I've seen the boats coming in. The local populations are extremely generous, they are extremely kind to the people. Most of the populations in Europe, let's just not have this idea that Europeans are somehow incredibly cold hearted. No, Countries no in Europe have that, taken in a lot of people and they are trying to deal with a very big problem very sure. swiftly. They're just putting the numbers in context, let me just mention sure. this very briefly. Three million people sought asylum in Europe between 2015 and 2016. That's mm -hmm. a fraction of the population of Europe, which is 508 sure. million. And uh, Germany and Sweden took in 3% uh, of the population in one year alone. So we're not talking about so negligible numbers, and no, you shouldn't pretend that we are. Not across the board, certainly. Douglas sure. Murray, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. That is an example of a host who is just completely unprofessional. Her biases are actually radiating off of her. And her tactics are very cheap as well. She's aiming to attack Douglas. She wants to ask him questions and then just interrupt him straight after. And every time he makes a good point, she interrupts. And that's just the cheapest trick in the book. Plus, she just kept on strawmanning him, which is just the most basic of logical fallacies, and then insulted him by calling him oblivious. But the worst, most egregious example, playing an absolutely heart-wrenching clip and then making sure everybody knows that many hundreds of women and children died after that phone call. And you can see the agenda that she's pushing there. And the agenda is to make it seem as though Europe is heartless and they should be taking in more migrants. And I personally don't think that's the case. I mean, countries like Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Sweden have completely changed their demographics because of this migrant crisis. And I think that in many cases, obviously they're not perfect and you can't get this sort of situation perfect. But a lot of these countries have been very kind and welcoming to refugee. Migrants who got on boats across the English Channel from France to Britain are given free accommodation in hotels, free healthcare, free dental care, free education for their kids, and also free prepaid debit cards. Asylum seekers in the UK last year were given £160 million in direct debit payments, and the UK government was spending £7 million a day on hotel accommodation for them. Now, with those numbers and considering the country has rampant inflation and cost of living prices are going through the roof, they've got a housing crisis and rising energy prices with all of these factors, meaning that more and more people are living below the poverty line in that country, I would have a few questions to ask too if I was them, especially when you consider that more people are coming from Albania than any other country. And Albania is not a war-torn country. Albania is a pretty safe country. So they're economic migrants. They're not refugees fleeing war. They are pretty much all young men looking for better economic opportunities. Gida, actually, one thing that I noticed uh, on Twitter, people engaged a lot with what you said directly to Douglas Murray. Uh, I think you made the point that uh, you said you must you must be forgetting, you said, that the developed world moved into the developing world without their permission. That's uh, got a lot of tweets, uh, gifs, and memes that have been circulating online. So we've got a lot of engagement. I still want to know what you think. Twitter, hashtag Dear World, get in touch with me and I'll read your comments online. Khida, Thanks back to you. so much, Nilufar. Very interesting to hear. We'll come back to you, of course, a little later. But I understand we have the results. Let's put them up and see how. The different statements have played out with our audience, both here and online. Do we have a clear winner, so to speak? Well, we've got a couple of positions that got more than the third one. Resist power pushback. That was Mark Lemont Hill. That's almost 40% of your votes. Then education. Education, hope. Uh, what we heard from Muzun, about 34.7% of the vote. And. Uh, Keep justice and mercy in balance. Some people have bought into this argument, Douglas Murray, some haven't, as you might expect. But quite, quite a close call, though, I have to say. It wasn't like one statement or one argument won over everyone's votes. Yeah, I'm Hamad Bahawash. I'm a senior at Georgetown University. And my question is to Mr. Douglas Murray. And before I ask my question, I just want to say, you said no sound bites, but then you said the developing world cannot move to the developed world. I don't know what that's I think about. I said it before. Uh, my question is, uh, since you brought up migration from the developing world, uh, I'd like to ask you this. Every year, 
the developed world sends about $300 billion of aid to the developing world, but the developing world sends back trillions in debt repayments uh, to the developed world. Now, um, don't you think that this is why, that this is the main reason why migrants are moving to Europe? Because money is moving out of the developing world. Wealth is leaving the developing world and moving to the developed world to build on what Lamont Hill said. Don't you think this is why people are moving to the Western world, to the developed world? Well, no, I don't. I don't uh, again, I repeat the fact there are no simple answers. And if it was simply the fact that you could, I don't know, do a debt default or something and solve the whole migration issue, then, then that would be great. But it just isn't the case. You think that if, if, uh, if um, for instance, all uh, African countries were allowed to default on debt, that they'd become uh, uh, um, burgeoning, uh, flourishing uh, 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 societies? You think that the problem across, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa isn't just unbelievable greed and theft by politician after politician? You think that, that, that if you just wrote off the debt, that would stop being an issue and everyone would become transparent and clean in their dealings with money? I mean, the problems are much deeper than this. They're much deeper than just a, a simple solution like that. As, if I may just add quickly to the, the previous two uh, comments, the, the, the late, very distinguished American uh, diplomat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, had a, a wonderful rule he came up with, known as Moynihan's Law, where he said that, that uh, human rights, claims of human rights violations often happen in exactly inverse proportion to human rights violations. That is, you hear about them in the countries that are most free. And before long, you can end up with the presumption that the most free countries are the ones who are most abusive of human rights. And this happens with the case when we talk about our leaders and the ones... It's all very well. We can, we can talk about the Trump administration, we can talk about the democracies and, and so on for, for all, we, all we like. We can all make criticisms, and we all should. But, okay, Briefly. Mr. Putin, what are you going to do about him? What are you going to do about the mullahs in Iran? What are you going to do about the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia? You see, what we end up with is this situation. We go, oh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump. We can all do that. Believe me, I can riff on but Trump again, all, you're being all quite day. Selective, aren't what you? are you going to do about the people you can't do anything about? Are you going to ignore them? Are you going to give them a pass? Well, or are you just going to enjoy beating well, up on the democ I, I, democracy? I hate to have to interrupt you. There's something called democracy, though, isn't there? Elections. For um, sure. So I'm going to talk briefly about you know, my mother's experience as an immigrant, and I want to touch here on something that Mark Lamont Hill said, this power of education and telling people how refugees fit into the wider context of economic development. Here's why I'm very skeptical about that. Because when my mother arrived in the UK and her parents arrived in the UK, people still called them dirty packies. When she had graduated from Oxford University, she was still a brown person who was not seen as a citizen, right? So to what extent can we really sell this idea that being educated or fitting X, Y, and Z criteria is what you need to do as a refugee for people to humanize you? The inherent problem with these people is that they don't humanize you. You can't fulfill your oppressor's criteria so that they right. see you as human. So, so how do you humanize people? Dehumanizing refugees, thank you very much. And with this, let me go to you, uh, Douglas Murray. Because much of your uh, argument, Douglas, seems to be about the us versus them, the fact that, you know, we have our own values, our own Britishness, our own virtues, and they will come to our shores with their, their values, their traditions. You seem to almost suggest that they come to your countries with a lesser breed of values. No, Maybe. I don't think I said that at any point, and that's another time you've tried to put something in my well, mouth. Um, so when you talk about the difference the in list. values, what do you suggest? Um, look, uh, I, first of all, I didn't say that. I said that there are challenges, because we do know that there are challenges, and let, let's, let's just be frank about this. I mean, for instance, I, I've been in, in the Gulf for uh, the last week or so. Uh, I, I've... I see more burqas in my home city of London than I have seen in the Gulf in recent days, certainly here in Doha. Now, I can't say I'm delighted by the, the, the sight of more and more burqas in London. Uh, do, do I feel any hatred of the people who wear them? Of course not. Of course not. But I, I can't say I'm elated by it. And definitely there are times I think, you know, what percentage of burqas in this area becomes like 
not that pleasant for everyone else. But again, yeah. is it all down to burqas? Because again, you're not asking people in, with other traditions whether they care about the sight of people drinking alcohol well, or, or well, growing well, up in well, bikinis. You, well, again, well, it's a well, very we could, we could Western-centric viewpoint. I'm, I'm not, I have to say, you're, you're going to bark up the wrong tree if you think you're going to persuade a Brit that we should stop drinking alcohol because of people arriving in our country. I mean, that's not going to happen. The, these things well, are all a bit of give and take. You bring your but, own but, traditions that don't quite fit with theirs. Well, they don't. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are, as I said, and before we got all confrontational, which you did from the get-go, I said what the problem is here is that these things are all rubbing against each other. And in that situation, you have to work out what things you're willing to give up, which things you're willing to compromise on, and which ones you're not. You're not going to persuade the Brits to massively change their culture. But let me just make the point. Every single society has certain aspects of it it doesn't want to give up. This one will in Qatar. This one will. Everyone does. So please don't which try to make this values? a kind of bigoted which of European values? thing. Which of that would be a very, very dishonest way to... Lose. That would be a very dishonest but, but way to... Just answer this, this question debate. directly if you can. Which of your values are you most afraid to lose? Which ones are most threatened by oh, uh, the of arrival speech. of refugees? Freedom of speech. It's the first one. Oh, you think that's not a problem? I mean, you think uh, that's not a problem? But, but you I'll think let you sorry, take it no, on. no, no, let no, me, let me, let me pick up on that. Let me pick up on that. It's what very about the easy of to snigger. It's of very easy to snigger about this until you've had friends shot in a newspaper office. It's very easy to laugh about that until it's happened to people you know. So the host mentioned there that British people should be more sensitive about drinking alcohol in the street because of people who are coming into the country. And I think that that is just absurd. If you want people to welcome refugees into the country with open arms, the last thing you want to then tell them is, oh, you also have to change your cultural customs. And I believe that you have to respect the customs of the land that you're on, and that should be ubiquitous. And funnily enough, this debate is from 2017, but the World Cup in Qatar last year, we saw this exact thing playing out. The woke ideological colonizers tried to come to Qatar and impose their LGBTQ beliefs on the Qataris, and the Qataris swiftly rejected it. And I applauded them for that. They had their cultural custom, and they weren't going to bend the knee to the sexual ideologies and degeneracy of the woke Western left. They did the right thing, and I remember watching that, thinking the absolute gall, the chutzpah, on these lefties to be coming into a very religious Muslim country and trying to impose their beliefs. It was so embarrassing and cringeworthy. And to be honest, I think that the Western countries could learn a lot from the way that the Qataris dealt with that situation. They had absolutely no patience for this degenerate ideology to be put into sport. And countries like Qatar and the United Arab Emirates are becoming a lot safer and a lot more technologically advanced and even a lot more business friendly whilst the West is slowly eating itself from the inside out. Is there yeah. an over-exaggeration, Douglas, do you think, in the West, this fear of Islam or anything that looks so different to us? No, I mean, uh, the society I'm from is one of the most pluralistic and diverse societies on earth. You, you couldn't get a larger range of people of different backgrounds and ethnicities and languages than you have in Britain. And which it's is why, country. once again, if I may push back against this thing you are pushing, which is that these are sort of uniquely bigoted, un, unwelcoming societies. Not at all. The evidence in, on this part of the stage would suggest that Britain is not, if for anything, instance. I'm giving you the so, chance to tell us, from your so perspective, what you find uh, threatening or not about I would, refugees I, I'd coming suggest, to England. Let me answer that by... by by broadening, if I may. My suggestion would be, if we're to arrive at any kind of common understanding on this, is that we agree that, for instance, where there are people who pretend that everyone who arrives is a terrorist is, is, is barking mad, okay? We can agree with that, but don't laugh at people with serious concerns about serious security concerns either, because... Like what? Well, let me... Because... You know, we had this in 2015 when certain officials in, in Europe said the likelihood that anyone coming on the boats among the 1.5 million people who arrived in Germany are going to be violent in any way is total, you know, xenophobic fantasy. And everyone laughed until people started letting off bombs, until, like, in Ansbach in Germany, they just had a suicide bombing outside a wine bar. And it, it just stopped being quite so funny. So all I'm saying to you is, you can agree with me that people who say that most people arriving are going to be violent are ridiculous. Yes, but also don't claim it's ridiculous for people to have serious and sincere concerns about what is happening. Because if you do, there's no way anyone's going to arrive. And that is the yeah, reality. Yes. Absolutely, Mark. How do you deal with this? It is yeah, a reality. This is, <laughs> you know, it's the way a reality. people feel. No, it's a reality that people have sincere 
uh, and serious concerns. Sure. It doesn't mean that the serious and sincere concerns are rational or well-founded. Um, and I understand the idea that this often comes from the extreme, but in the United States, that extreme is the White House, yes. right? So, the, I mean, Donald Trump himself has been very clear in, in articulating the particular danger that Syrian refugees bring, despite the fact that they're vetted, despite the fact that they spend time in resettlement centers, but despite the fact that they're actually statistically much less likely to be engage in an acts of right. terror. And I think the Brexit propaganda, again, just to scare uh, right. people. I, yeah, it's not... It's not actually the first generation. The first generation are often the ones who do want to integrate and they just, just want to, at least yeah. my experience, you want to keep your head down, go to school, get a job, get, get going. It is that second generation that has grown up, born and grown up and feels a sense of unbelonging because they're not reflected at all in the education, in the history books, in the art, in the culture, and they are demonized. And that's the, that's the community we have to be well, dealing with and recognize, Dr. and I that's the pluralism I that are none of our society. I know you have something to say before I go to Nano We do, we do have ahead. to address that. Every society on Earth has difficulty integrating people, okay, from a very different background. Yes. It's always difficult, again, I don't think we should fall into this idea that you, Europeans are uniquely bad at it. We've had to do a lot of absorbing very fast, and we've done most of it very damn well. And bits of it haven't gone well, and we've got to address that. But again, we can agree that there is gun violence in America from crazy people who think they need to be armed to walk to the supermarket. And that crazy doesn't mean... Well, OK, but that doesn't mean that people in France don't have their own specific Absolutely. security concerns Absolutely. as well. And Absolutely. what I'm urging you to do is, to, um, to, let's not look at this just from an American point of view. In Europe, it is a serious security concern we have now, and we are trying to deal with it, and that shouldn't be laughed at. Something that doesn't get discussed very often is the fact that European and North American countries are the most tolerant places in the world. You can come from Nigeria and get your residence and be considered an American. You can come from Syria, get your residence and be considered British. And that's actually pretty unique. That really doesn't happen in many other places. I'm currently living in Japan at the moment and as an outsider, you can live here for as long as you want. You can get your residency, you can buy a house, but you'll never be Japanese. And that's because they have a lot of pride in their culture and they have a certain way of life that they just want to preserve. They're very strict with immigration. You can see the BBC lambasting them here for refusing immigration and maintaining patriarchy, for strict border controls, demanding people who come in adapt to their ways, rejecting immigration as a solution for failing fertility, and only 3% of the population being foreign born. Now this is because Japan is a peaceful, prosperous, and extremely safe country. They have the highest life expectancy in the world, the lowest murder rate in the world, and very little political conflict. Everybody here leaves their doors unlocked, and when they go and drive to the supermarket or to wherever, they just leave their keys in their ignition because it's Japan and it's so safe. Another example is South Korea. According to the Evening Standard, nearly half a million South Koreans signed a petition against their government's refugee-friendly migration policy. 520,000 people have signed a petition asking their governments to put Koreans before refugees and are seeking to revoke the Yemeni's refugee application. Hank Kim, owner of Core Travel Agency, has posed that people are worried about how immigrants have lived in Europe. He said local people here are worried. We have all read about the problems that immigrants have caused in Europe, in Germany and in France in particular, and we do not want that to happen here. He added, it has become really bad in recent weeks, and it is all because Jiju introduced a program that enabled people from 186 countries to come here without tourist visas. And you can judge Japan, you can judge Korea, and you can judge British people for having objections all you want. But I truly believe that if you keep on ignoring the concerns of citizens, they will only manifest themselves in more and more extreme incarnations of the ideas. The harsh and ugly reality is that people from different cultures and different countries have had different life experiences and will therefore have different cultural customs and will assimilate differently into different places. And my question is to you, Douglas. So you talked about people, be, um, us serving justice, and do you think it's judicious for these people in Britain, for example, you talked about how Britain is giving aid to these countries in Africa, it's judicious for them to give this much money to these countries but without even listening to their needs. So this only contributes to the white savior complex yeah. that is currently a big issue in okay. This Africa. whole notion of, of charity as opposed wow. to policy. Well, there is, there is a saying we have, damned if you do and damned if you don't. 
if it's the case that if we don't give aid, we'd be accused of not giving aid, and if we do give aid, it's a white savior complex. I mean, we can all give aid better, for sure, and I just gave in my opening remarks what I think was a, a serious suggestion for one very good use of aid, which is to prioritize it in the region and in the neighboring countries of people, places people are fleeing from. But, I mean, as I say, I, I ref would refuse as well to see the multifarious problems that exist in, in your own home country and sadly across the continent of Africa. I refuse to say that that's, you know, because of foreign aid only. It's so many things. So many things have gone wrong there, and you know that better than I do. You can see how agitated Douglas Murray is here by his body language, and you can imagine how uncomfortable it would be because he came here to have a discussion, and then the host just got on the attack straight away. And Douglas Murray mentioned free speech, and free speech is something that is held in particularly high regard in the West, albeit slowly eroding, and is not something that's as valued in other countries. And when I say free speech, I mean the ability to be able to criticize government openly and the ability to be able to criticize religion openly, which, side note, is pretty cool that this debate is happening in Doha and Qatar. And I truly believe that what he just mentioned about free speech is one of the biggest problems with multiculturalism. Because in order to have a functioning society, you need to have an overarching structure that everybody abides by and that everybody assimilates into. You can't have one one law for this person and one law for that person and different ideologies always warring against each other. It just doesn't work. So like Douglas, I've got many more questions than answers about this one. So I ask you guys, what is the solution when it comes to freedom of speech and multiculturalism? So with that, I know that there was a lot in this video and I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody's thoughts, opinions and experiences in regard to this topic. So until next time, I'm Jake. This has been Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous. And don't forget to click here if you want to watch another video. And if you want to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, click right here.